Hi, dear friends, cultural creatives and seekers everywhere. We're going to continue our journey on things that medicine says we don't need in our body, but are actually fundamentally important for our survival. Well, in our last episode, we talked about the nature of the appendix. Today, we're going to go actually a little on the molecular side. Today, we're going to talk about something called junk DNA. Junk DNA? What does that mean? DNA that is useless? When the Human Genome Project was finished, it was recognized that only about 3% of our DNA actually codes for the human body, meaning 97% of the DNA, according to the scientists, had no function in this. Humans like to think of everything we call an anthropoetic version, meaning what if it thinks like a human? And so they're looking at the cell, and they're looking at the understanding of this DNA, and thinking as a human, they go, oh, that's useless DNA. It's been copied over for a billion years and just left in the system as junk DNA. So the whole idea was to give it no importance in the understanding of our life. Well, guess what? Human Genome Project After Effects, understanding what's happening, gives us a whole new insight to what's going on. First of all, 3% of our DNA does indeed code for the existence of our human body. Something very interesting that we'll talk about in a future episode is that from 5 to 8% of our DNA actually codes viral genes that we make viruses called exosomes. So now we're talking about 11% or 8% of the DNA that still leaves us with 90%. What's that DNA? Well, we have to recognize something. Epigenetics is the mechanism by which environmental signals control the development and expression of our genetic activity. Well, how can it do that? Well, can it just turn a gene on and off? Well, if it did that, then we'd still have the same gene, the same protein on and off. It wouldn't be that much of a difference. But there's a way of modifying or modulating the expression of a gene. Well, how do you do that? Well, I like to give an analogy for people to understand that in the old days, before television was on 24 hours a day, in the evening, the broadcast studios would put on something called a test pattern. And the test pattern was really for technicians to adjust the television, get the focus, the contrast, the dimensions of height, width, get it into clear, sharp focus. And that was the use of the test pattern. Well, the test pattern is from a broadcast. But guess what? The technician on adjusting the television turns specific dials to expand the width, shorten the height, tune the sharpness of the picture, increase the contrast, change the color. So you're changing the appearance of that test pattern on the television. You can totally distort the television pattern. Well, the question becomes very important, and that is this. Are you distorting the original broadcast? The original broadcast is coming in, but the television is taking that broadcast and modifying the effects of it. And so all those dials on the television for adjustment are modifiers. Well, it turns out the junk DNA is actually a strand of DNA that contains the equivalent of those dials, dials that can change the readout of the DNA being used. So, for example, uh, one of the uh, dials, and let, let's give it a scientific name. They're called modules, protein modules. Uh, and they're equivalent of the dials on a television, and they're scattered along the length of the junk DNA. So, for example, one module can turn the gene on and off. One module can increase the volume of the gene. But the others actually change the expression of the gene. They can cut the gene into segments, show parts of it. They can glue segments back together again. They can modulate the expression. And these are all the dials just in front of the gene that's going to be regulated. So as the signals from the environment come in, they adjust the modules, the proteins, which in turn adjust the readout of the DNA. So the most important fact is this. Epigenetic mechanisms interface the gene through the modules on what is so-called the junk DNA. Now think about this. The DNA of a, a human and the DNA of a chimpanzee are almost totally identical. Well, 
how could that be when there are obviously different structures that come from this? And the answer is, it's not the gene program, it's the readout of the gene program that determines the difference. For example, a gene called keratin makes many things in the body. The fingernails are keratin, the skin is keratin, the hair is keratin. I go, well, keratin then can create different forms. I go, yeah, but the same keratin gene. Well, how can you do that? Through the modules, you can change the readout of the keratin and make it a, a, a fingernail, or in other animals, make a claw. Same gene, but the whole idea is what? How you adjusted the readout. Now, in understanding this, epigenetics says, I can change the readout of the gene like I could change the readout of the TV pattern, but I'm not changing the gene. That's a very important insight to understand about epigenetics. So, by adjusting the modules, I can create all different variations from a single gene. As a matter of fact, up to 3,000 different versions of proteins can be created from one gene based on the readout. Where's the junk? All of that is actually the most important part of the DNA because it says how this DNA will be assembled and used to create a human body. If you took out the junk DNA, it would be no real body coming from that. You might get something, but it wouldn't really be functional because it's the epigenetic control that adjusts the genes so that the organism fits into the environment. So. We're going to have to change that concept, junk DNA. It's perhaps some of the most important DNA you have in your biology. So again, let's look. Sometimes science says we know everything, and then we have to revise our understanding. And this is one particular case.